You know, how can we develop? How can we grow? How can we give opportunities? How can we ask questions to inspire people to take their next step? How do we spot talent and you know, also that we can pick the right people in the first place? Welcome to the Vanderbloom and Leadership Podcast, where we talk about how to build, run, and keep a great team. I'm your host, Holly Tate, and on today's podcast, I am so excited to talk with my friend and colleague, Tim Stevens. Tim was the executive pastor at Granger Community Church for 20 years before he joined our team here at Vanderbloom and Search Group. At Granger, he helped build it from a couple hundred people to over 6,000 people attending on the weekends. In this episode, Tim and I talk about what he does here at Vanderblumen as he's on the front lines of ministry, helping our churches and ministries build their teams. We also talk about his latest book, Fairness is Overrated. So be sure to tweet your takeaways along with us using the hashtag Vandercast. That's hashtag Vandercast. So Tim, I'd love to hear just kind of an overview of your story, how you grew up and what brought you to be in ministry. Yeah, so grew up very much uh, in a Christian family and um, supported by family, supported by my parents, um, somewhat of a um, legalistic environment as mm-hmm. I look back on it. It didn't hurt me at all. I got a lot of uh, great grounding um, and um, spiritual upbringing. And then kind of sprung into the world, went right into a nonprofit organization called Life Action Ministries and was able to get a ton of experience early on traveling the country, uh, hundreds of churches that we went around and did ministry in, a group of college age students basically. Um, singing and teaching and helping with kids and singing. that kind of thing. Did you sing? I did not sing. <laughs> I was like, I, I didn't was, know you sang. I made him sound good. I was the audio guy for a while. I actually did sing for one year. There was one year they were desperate. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my microphone was never on. <laughs> I'm pretty convinced they never said that, but uh, oh, I could hold a tone, great. but I didn't sound good. Uh, but, but did that for nine years, met my wife there. Oh, cool. And um, she had also joined up with that team. Uh, now, right Faith Sings. Faith is a beautiful singer. Yep. So she sings great. Um, and so then uh, as we got married and started having kids, worked into leadership there, and then started attending this little church startup down the road, meeting in a movie theater, um, Granger Community Church. Started there. There was a couple hundred people there when we started attending, and the pastor started talking to us about coming on the team. And it was at that point, there was a whole whole lot more kind of painting the dream and the vision than there was reality because it was a pretty small church at that point. It's about six years old. Um, But joined up with the team, um, left the ministry I was at and came on as executive pastor in 1994 and kind of got to do the run with them for 20 years. Yeah. Wow. And talk about, um, I'd love to hear just the key chapters in your time at Granger. So some people who are listening are going to be at a church plant. You know, maybe, it, you know, 200 is actually a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. that's a big church plant. So maybe they have 50 people on Sunday or maybe they're at a mega church of 6,000, which is, you know, about where Granger was when you left. So I'd love to hear what the key ceilings were as you were there over 20 years, those key markers mm. as you were the executive pastor. Yeah. Um, I think a a couple that come to mind real quickly. One is um, early on, and I don't know what size we were when we hit the ceiling, but early on there comes a point, um, specifically with the lead pastor and specifically with the founding pastor, where they have to, you know, when they start the church, they're involved in everything. They know everyone. They're intimately involved in every part of the ministry. And there comes a time when they have to kind of give up to go up, um, when they have to release that, when it has to be okay that not everyone has access to them when they're they have to kind of think through okay who am i going to focus and i'm going to focus in kind of my my staff my key volunteer leaders and i think for uh, my lead pastor there was a point at which he kind of had to cross over i remember at one point early on standing in the hallway by the coffee maker talking to him and him just kind of saying you know i i know i have what it takes to to start a church i don't know if i have what it takes to lead a large church Mm -hmm. and it was just kind of it was one of those times it was just like okay i don't know if I don't know if I want to give up to go up, but ultimately making that uh, making that shift. Um, I think another one that comes to mind. Uh, let, me, let me add to that too. Um, yeah, it's not just the lead pastor as the church gets bigger; it's all the staff kind of has to do that. They have to 
um, if they're going to grow with the church, if the church is growing, um, there's parts of things that they love doing they kind of have to give up or they have to empower um, other people to do. Um, the other thing I was going to say, just related to ministry ceilings, um, is the empowerment of lay people, of volunteers. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, in some churches, they tend to give them um, menial duties, change mm-hmm. the diapers, hand out the bulletins, and all of that stuff needs to be done, and we need teams to do that. But I think churches that, that have figured out how to keep growing, they figure out how to give, like, significant responsibilities to volunteers. Yeah. Um, so that they feel like they're adding, uh, they're making a difference, and they're able to use how God's wired them. You wrote a book about that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you and uh, Tony Morgan, right. uh, Simply Strategic Volunteers. Right. And I know that's just been such a gift to so many church leaders because it's 10 years old now, right? Yeah, it is. But it is. I still see it you know, online as one of the thought leadership books in volunteers. Um, what do you think allows churches to be able to empower volunteers like that? Is it... Did you have somebody on staff who that was their responsibility, or was that your responsibility as the executive pastor? You know, I think so. A lot of churches, and we did for a season at Granger, have someone responsible for that. I think it's better when you don't, um, because I think when you have one person on staff that's the volunteer coordinator, or director, or whatever, um, everyone looks to them to do that. And I yeah. think it's much better just to to um, make it part of your leadership culture, um, so that everyone's thinking through how do we develop the volunteers. Um, how do we spot talented volunteers? How do we make this work for them with, with their normal life and so it's not too overwhelming, too overbearing? Um, how do we make the ask? You know, mm-hmm. How do we really boldly ask and um, call someone into something that they really can't picture themselves doing and coaching them and mentoring them? I think if, if that's true throughout the church life, then it's a, a lot more effective long term. Yeah. What do you think makes an effective executive pastor? I mean, that title can mean a million different things, but especially here in your role at Vanderbilt, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, but what are some of the key things that you feel like make a really effective executive pastor? Um, I think a couple things come to mind. One is they can't, I think an effective executive pastor doesn't want to be in the number one seat. They're very, mm-hmm. very comfortable being in the number two seat. And they're there not to, um, you know, develop or, or cast their own vision, although sometimes that will be part of the job. But mostly they're there to kind of make the vision alive for the, the lead pastor, for the leadership team. And I think that's really important. It's a different kind of leadership gift because um, yeah. in some ways, you know, especially as the church grows, they're responsible for scores of staff, maybe. Um, so they're definitely a, a um, what's uh, Maxwell calls it, a level five leader. They're, yep. they're, they're a high level leader, um, but they're not just always kind of vying and waiting for that number one seat because that's when the, the chemistry between the executive pastor and the lead pastor is so crucial mm-hmm. that that's when things can get really muddy and unclear. Second thing that comes to mind is um, I, this wouldn't be true just for executive pastors, but I think any um any leader high level leader um is they're they're less about um communicating kind of what do i think and this is the way to do it and they're more about asking questions and drawing the best out of their people yeah um and leading people to um greatness or to the, their most the potential mm-hmm. um because of the way they lead and ask questions and inspire and motivate um in a very informal one-on-one way yeah, you're so good at that. I'm just my observing you. You're so good at the asking questions part. You well, know, thank you. I think it's something that sounds really easy. It's like, oh yeah, I can ask people questions to inspire them, but it's really hard um, and does take a special gift to really mm-hmm. implement that. So that's that's key. So one of the things that I've heard you say before that I just think is amazing is when you left Granger, out of the 129 staff members that you know you were overseeing, 123 of them were internal hires. Is that right? Yeah, right. So I just want to talk about how that's even possible (laughs) because a lot of, um, I think a lot of people listening probably can't even imagine what that even looks like. So talk to me, you know, first of all, was that something that you aspired to or did it just kind of happen? Um, I would say it more happened. It became more of a conviction over time Mm -hmm. of of, um, how crucial it, it it was. I, I, we were probably about, 
Uh, ten. I was probably there about ten years um, when I started like really thinking about it and mm-hmm. taking a look at everyone we'd hired up to that point. Um, and I like you know actually just wrote names down on a piece of paper and kind of whether they were internal or external hires. Yeah. And just the the level of success that we had um, keeping and growing and developing internal hires versus external was uh, hugely different. Um, so that could that could say something about us and how we did poorly with external hires. I don't know, but. <laughs> But with internal hires, I just think, you know, when you hire someone, and, and by internal, by definition, they've, they're have they already attending the church. They're already part of the organization. So um, so they already have they, they already have bought into the vision. Mm-hmm. You know, they've prob- they're probably a member. They're probably volunteering. They're probably volunteering at a pretty high level. Um, so you've gotten a chance to see them and how they work and their strengths and their weaknesses, and you know that they embrace what you're, what you're about. And so... Um, so many times with external hires, we do a poor job of uh, onboarding, yeah. and so they don't they don't quite get or or maybe when we're interviewing them, we don't you know everything's on paper and they know our values, and but they think the values mean something and they're different when mm-hmm. it actually plays out. And so um, with internal hires, you already you already passed all that. Um, so I think you know having a culture where where you can develop them and you can coach them and mentor them. Um, from because you know virtually all of them came from marketplace or just normal work jobs yeah into ministry and so there's a little bit of a hurdle there and you just have to be able to kind of work them through that and give space for that and time for that yeah so how did you even start implementing any sort of development process um, I would imagine for a lot of church leaders that's overwhelming it's like yeah that sounds great to develop a leadership kind of track so that you can hire internal but where do you even start so for us, it was less of a track and less of a, um, um, a model or less it wasn't, there wasn't like classrooms or, or anything like that we went through. It was more of developing a leadership culture. Mm-hmm. And, and just so that, um, and this is kind of vague, and, um, but just so that leadership development is kind of just in the air you breathe. Um, which takes time and takes years and years and years to develop that to where people to you know you got someone who's thinking it and then you got three people that are thinking it and then you got ten people that are thinking that way you know how can we develop how can we grow how can we give opportunities how can we ask questions to inspire people to take their next step how do we spot talent and you know, also that we can pick the right people in the first place one of the downsides of internal hires is they're so interconnected in the church that if it goes bad, yeah. it goes bad. That's tough. Because um, they didn't just move in town and then they can move out. It's like their aunts and uncles and kids and parents and all their best friends and their small group. And everyone's impacted by a decision when something has to go bad. So you, so you want to get that right on the front side. Yeah, absolutely. There's a higher stake there, an mm-hmm. emotional higher stake, mm-hmm. I think. So what about that time where you've looked internally you know, so I guess, you know, the five, six, six, uh, yep. six, <laughs> <laughs> math, math is hard. Yeah. Good thing I'm in marketing and not, uh, math. Um, the five that were, sorry, the six that were external, you know, when do you know that it's time to go outside to find those people yeah. that you don't have internally? Yeah. And that's a, that's a great question. Cause people have heard me talk about internal hires and then, and then they saw that I joined Vanderbloom and they're like, how do, this doesn't connect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to me, there's um, there's important times when you need to look outside. Um, and as I th- as kind of reflect back on my time at Granger, there were times I wish we would have looked outside um, uh, at different seasons. But I think w- one time is there's if if a minister if either the church as a whole or a minister area is stuck in mm-hmm. some way, it's plateaued, it's declining, it's broken, uh, and you're finding that kind of the same old the same old is not working. You just need a you need a fresh infusion of new thinking yeah um you need someone from the outside that doesn't think like you um, which is really hard um to admit because it's like we think we're awesome right yeah most people think that you know (laughs) and so it's really hard to admit that we need some help we need someone from the outside and it doesn't it doesn't mean you're bringing someone in who's at a bigger and better church it may be a much smaller church but they've they've got something figured out in an area where you need help and so that's i think that's a time when I think um, you need to bring someone, look at someone from the outside. Another time would be a lot of churches don't have the leadership development thing pegged, and um, and that's hard to develop, and it requires some intentionality. So I think, you know, for a church that that's not as much there, um, bringing someone in with, 
hiring someone internally that just has a lot of potential, mm -hmm. well, they're kind of going to stay there unless someone's really being um, um, very intentional and focused on developing them as a leader. And so if you don't have that, then it probably makes more sense to bring someone in from the outside that does bring some of that experience. They're, they've already kind of achieved something at some level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that's a great transition into talking about your role here on our team at Vanderblumen. So what in the world do you do all day, every yeah. day here on our team? <laughs> yeah, so I get to oversee the uh, executive search consultant team. Um, we have, including myself, we have eight on our team now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exciting. Um, I get to, um, one of my favorite things as an executive pastor was to, what we, stuff we just talked about was to develop staff, um, spot talent, develop staff, um, free them up for um, great ministry. Um, and so I get to do that w both internally and externally with our team. So yeah. it's kind of... Um, with some pretty amazing people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, real high level. And I, I don't know if most people know, but I, all of our consultants have served, at a, you know, either pastors or high level staff positions in churches. And yep. so they have this heart for ministry and this heart for the kingdom. And um, and also these get this giftedness um, to be able to do what they do um, with our churches. And so... It's just a fun, it's a great team to lead. Um, they're, they're not prima donnas. They're humble in mm -hmm. their leadership, and, and they're really good, and they're very natural with, um, with our churches that we work with. And so, so I, I do that. That's kind of half my job, and the other half is actually working with churches and helping them find staff, yeah. um, which is, man, to come alongside a church um, at a you know, real key, either crisis or significant kind of watershed moment is you know it just brings such significance um, to the kingdom and to myself and to the church and so it's uh it's humbling to be able to do that yeah and so what is one of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing churches make right now as you're traveling all around the country um, visiting churches of all different denominations and all different sizes <laughs> who have their own unique challenges what are some of the key mistakes that you see churches make regarding team building specifically um Probably one would be just not having an intentional, not being intentional about team building. Mm -hmm. um, I think some, something that, that senior pastors or, or high level pastors in churches struggle with sometimes is actually giving away um, ministry. Um, not just will you go and do this, but you know, you cast the vision and cast the dream, which um, leaders do, and then let the staff, let the team figure it out. Yep. Um, and when you do that, when there's space for that, it draws high capacity leaders, people that really, I mean, they want to, they have the capacity to really get it done. If, if um, as leaders, we're going in and constantly course correcting and it's like, oh, that's great, but that's not the way I want it done. I want it done this way. If we do that over and over and over, um, then the high-level leaders are not going to stay, and we're not going to have you know, solid growing teams. And so I think that's something that's it's really hard, especially if it's a founding pastor, because when they started again when they were young, they did everything, and then suddenly you know the church has got beyond that, and so they're handing a whole lot more off, um, and they're um, they're very intent on on staying focused or, or staying on the path with the mission, vision, values, which they need to be. Um, but sometimes they can confuse mission, vision, values with the how it gets done. Yeah. And um, so I think that's one big mistake. Yeah, that's a really good one. So we, in our work here, you and I talk to a lot of people across the country who are thinking about, you know, maybe God's called them to a different position, but it's out of state. And they're thinking, is this really what God's calling me to? This is a huge move for my family. Mm. And you went through that mm. from your transition from Granger to Vanderblumen. I mean, you moved your family across the country, um, not only to a different environmental climate, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but a culture and even from ministry to, um, you know, the bu a business setting. So I would love to hear what your advice is for those people who are listening, who are struggling with that right now, trying to figure out, is this right for my family? Yeah. What advice would you give them as you led your family through that transition? Wow, there's we probably could talk about this for the whole time. <laughs> yeah. There's so many factors to that. Um, I think, um, you know, for me, the decision was uh, t was two different decisions. It was one is my season done where I was at, and then it was the second part of that was okay. Now what? What do I do now? What, what's next? And so, um, 
some people go through the decision where um, um, those are one and the same, mm -hmm. you know, where they just feel a call or a nudge to something else, and it's kind of one. For me, it was pretty distinct. Um, you know, for me, being at the same place for 20 years, you know, and it was a place I planned to retire from. I mean, I never planned to leave. Yeah. Um, so made it, you know, and kids in school and all that made it a very, very, you know, weighty decision um, for us. But one one book that was helpful to me is a book called Necessary Endings by um, Henry Cloud. And it's a great book, even if you're not planning to leave where you're at, just to even think through what do we need to end as far as ministries in our church or outreaches or whatever. Um but just that there's a season to uh, everything. Everything yeah. has a season. And, and so, and some things that it's not failure when something comes to an end. That, mm. that there's a, a lot of times there's good reasons and good, good part of the decision. So some, for me, being at the same place for so long, I really had to kind of w weigh that through um, of just, is, you know, is it, is it the right time? Is it the right season? Is it right for my family? Is it right for the church? Um, and so, and those are weighty decisions. I would say, uh, one piece of advice would be get most of your counsel from outside your church, not inside. I think it's not real helpful, especially as leaders in churches, to be having conversations about do I do I really want to be here? Or should I be here with people in the church? Yeah. Or with people on staff? It just it's not helpful. And even even if you have in your you know best friend relationships, um, it's just really not helpful for their journey and um, to be having that conversation and and it doesn't communicate support to the church. So I would say get people. Um, away from you outside that have perspective that aren't in the weeds with you and they can really um, give some insight to that because um, it's it's a huge decision and you need the counsel yeah um, so I had people you know in our situation that just you know three or four real key people that I was able to um, talk to on a regular basis um, that were able to help me with that decision that's awesome. And that's such, you know, regardless of whether you're thinking about going through a transition or not, it's so important for pastors to have people that they can go to in confidence mm -hmm. outside of their church. Because that's one of the things that we talk a lot about here. You know, pastors, their social and spiritual and emotional support is usually all at the same place. Mm -hmm. And their professional support, yeah. too. You know, yeah. a lot of us who are outside of the church world, we get to have our friends at work and our friends outside of work and our friends at church. And we kind of have these... Yeah compartments but pastors don't always have that luxury and um and it's real hard to be um it's real hard for pastors to be vulnerable with people that they're leading um for right or for wrong it's just hard um, because you feel like you're letting them down or you just can't there's there's expectations people put you on a pedestal and then you kind of have to live up to that so um but when they're when you have people far away and people are close to you and people that know you well um but they're not in your setting there's a lot more freedom for them. Yeah, that's great advice. So I want to talk about your book, uh, your latest book, Fairness is Overrated. Talk to me about what inspired you to write that book, because it was a little bit different from the other ones that you've written. Yeah. Um, so it really was a, it is a compilation of just kind of what was in me related to leadership, um, leading teams, building organizations, hiring teams, um, the integrity of leadership. And so, you know, in some ways, it's just like, okay, I got to get all this out of me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, the, and the book is written in kind of standalone chapters, although they're categorized into four big buckets. But it's really 52 kinda, chapters. Yes. Yeah, that's what I love about it is you can read a chapter in a few minutes and yeah. get a lot yeah. out of it. And that's, I, I write that way because I read that way. I mm -hmm. mean, I really, I'm, I'm not going to most of the time read kind of, if it's, if it's 50 or 60 or 80 page chapters, it's not yeah. going to capture my attention <laughs> usually. Um, so, um, and the other thing is I, I was and still am, I was re really connected with business leaders in the business community. And there's so much carryover mm -hmm. um, with church leadership and business leadership. And there's so much that um, I've learned from business leaders and so much that business leaders can learn from church leaders. And so... Um, and so to me, it was like very, there's maybe three chapters in the book that are specific to church leaders, but, but it was so much carryover that, uh, began working with the publisher and really oriented it towards both, yeah. um, both, both leaders, just any Christian leader, basically, whether they're leading in the church or in business. And so that was, uh, unique because all of my other books were very much targeted for church leaders. Mm -hmm. What chapter is your favorite? Like if you, if somebody can only read one chapter, which... There's so many great ones, but which one would you absolutely want them to read? Well, I guess um, I, I may have a different answer tomorrow, but yeah. um, 
there's a chapter, I probably couldn't even tell you what the title is, but questions is in the title. Yeah, um, I think it's called Asking Questions, right? Might be, might or, be called, that's, that'd be a great like title. So yeah. maybe that's the title <laughs> of that chapter. But it is it is about what we just talked about earlier um, in this conversation, just about being um, – so many leaders think they're. Uh, so many leaders um, carry themselves as though they're the smartest person in any room they walk into. Yep. Um, and people pick up on that, and then they shut down, mm-hmm. and so they won't participate because they don't need to because the smart guy just walked in. And I think um, really smart leaders um, ask a ton of questions, and they always assume they're not the smartest person in the room on a specific topic. And so they're always wanting to, to learn. And, and by doing that, then they're pulling the best out of the people. And so that's the one that comes to mind right now. That's awesome. Well, we always like to end every podcast with some, some quick questions. Um, so tell us about a book that you've been reading lately that you've just loved. Um, well, I already mentioned Necessary Endings, which was great. We went through with – we do an executive pastor coaching network here at Vanderblumen. And so we went through a book called Courage mm-hmm. recently by – I think it's by Gus Lee. Um, which is all about um, just being courageous when you have to enter into conflict or you have to have a tough conversation. It's a, it's a really great book. And what about an app that you've used lately that you just feel like you can't live without now? Wow, the one I spend the most of the time in is United Airlines app. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I bet. Uh, boy, I would say on um, apps, so I'm a little bit of a geek, mm-hmm. okay? So there's an app called MacHash. Oh, and I haven't heard of this basically one. Basically, um, it, it pulls together all of the uh, Mac-related geeky news that's out there. Yeah. And kind of you get it in one place, and so I can learn what's coming and what's happening and all that. So what's a sneak peek that you've learned from that app that, well, of what's coming? Well, September 9th-ish is going to be the next announcement of the iPhone, which they haven't. Apple hasn't announced yet, um, but they will soon. So You've got the inside scoop. That's maybe, awesome. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. <laughs> And then this is one of our favorite questions. Tell us about a time when you just blew it on stage in ministry. Uh, um, well, so I usually, especially early in my career, I needed, um, I, I would, I just completely blank. Yeah. And so I always, you know, I, I've always envied guys who can get up and just talk. You know, they study and then they just talk and it's like, oh my goodness. I, would, I wouldn't even know what the topic was you know, <laughs> at times in the talk. And there was a there was a time when I was doing a talk, I completely lost. I had no idea. Um, and I looked, Rob Wegner's one of my good friends uh, who was a pastor also at our, our staff. So uh, I looked down to him and said, Rob, where was, what was I talking about? What, what's next? And he wasn't listening. <laughs> That's how compelling Thanks, my talking Rob. was. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, I got nothing. I have no idea. And so I just had to like, okay, next, and just walk off the stage. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that was a little embarrassing. I'm sure no one remembers it. But. How many people were you in front of? Oh, five, six hundred. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is a great story. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day on our team here to talk with us on the Vander Woman Leadership Absolutely. Podcast. So. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. You can connect with us on Twitter at VanderblumenSG and hashtag your key takeaways with hashtag Vandercast. You can also receive more information about what we do here at Vanderblumen Search Group and notes from today's podcast at vanderblumen.com backslash podcast. See you next time.